Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Song Ho Shin uh, from Seoul National University. Uh, I'm a chair for the uh, third and the final session of uh, today's uh, wonderful seminar, uh, hosted, uh, organized by the Korean Association of International Studies and hosted by Korean Ministry of Foreign uh, Affairs. And uh, we have a great, again, uh, interesting topic and great uh, panels today. We'll talk about the uh, new uh, Biden administration and uh, Korea-US relations. Uh, uh, we have uh, three uh, uh, great uh, presenters and wonderful uh, uh, three discussions. And I really would like to also, first of all, thank uh, all our uh, panel, especially from uh, joining us through the Zoom uh, from, uh, uh, not in this way, the abroad, and which, uh, whom I will introduce later on. So uh, uh, first, uh, without further ado, uh, let me invite uh, the first presenters. And uh, Professor uh, Leif Eric Easley from uh, Iwa Women's University, uh, who will talk about US aligned strategy in Asia and the North Korean nuclear issue. And uh, uh, each presenter will have about 15 to 20 minutes. And uh, Professor Isley, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much, Professor Shin. It's such an honor to join distinguished colleagues on this panel, and I've enjoyed watching the previous uh, sessions online. Uh, it's wonderful what this technology can do, and uh, I appreciate the organizers uh, bringing us together safely during the COVID pandemic, but uh, bringing us together nonetheless to discuss such timely and important subjects. Uh, really, um, I think this is an opportune moment to bring such uh, an international and uh, a diverse group of speakers together to address the Biden administration's uh, developing foreign policy, and of course the changing geopolitical and economic and everything from public health and non-traditional security issues in Asia. As Professor Shin mentioned, my uh, role will be discussing U.S. alliance strategy in Asia and the North Korea nuclear issue. And if I had to summarize my remarks in one sentence, it would be that U.S. foreign policy is indeed changing with the new administration, but international challenges endure. And the politics here in the region may be just as important or even more so than the US domestic politics that have been addressed a bit already today. So obviously Joe Biden's electoral victory uh, has brought a different team uh, to the White House and uh, to, to the halls of American power, but the election itself uh, showed a high degree of political polarization in American politics. And I think there's a lot of hand-wringing, frankly, in my own country about how much there is to do domestically and how much uh, the world may have been shocked to see the messy transition uh, in the recent US presidential election. But this process may actually um, produce a more humble and uh, policy-focused president, which may be what, frankly, the United States needs to heal from self-defeating populism uh, and the urban-rural disparities that we're facing, and of course also what we're talking about today, renewing American leadership in foreign policy. And I think that from the perspective of many of America's allies and partners, uh, while the election and its transition weren't pretty, uh, U.S. governing institutions held. They held through uh, a, a peaceful transfer of power despite the political rancor and the cyber threats and the pandemic. And I don't think that the world is going to be so interested in continuing to adjudicate the Trump presidency. Rather, I think many of the U.S. Uh, allies and partners will be more interested in policy coordination and policy outcomes because there's just simply too much to be done in terms of rebuilding globalization to be more health resilient, socially equitable, and environmentally sustainable. Now, 
It's also really important, I think, to say at the outset that change in Washington has not washed away friction in U.S.-China relations over trade, cyber espionage, the pandemic, security in the South China Sea and around Taiwan, human rights in Xinjiang, Tibet, Hong Kong, and elsewhere. These issues are going to be very important subjects of alliance coordination, international debate, and forthcoming multilateral action. And when it comes to considering the North Korea nuclear issue, which I'll focus on, I think the challenges are formidable and merit an assessment in light of the new administration uh, as it fills key government positions and reshapes policy. So first, let me say a few words about Biden versus Trump uh, on Asia and how what we're seeing now is going to probably unfold to be quite a bit different than the last four years. Given the new leadership in the United States, the current holding pattern with North Korea is likely to be shook up a bit. But it's not going to automatically solve any of the problems that have long been faced with Pyongyang. The Trump administration was not close to concluding a peace declaration in its final months in office. And while South Korea makes very constructive offers of humanitarian cooperation, military confidence building, the Kim regime appears to want much larger economic projects. So we still have quite a bit of a deadlock to untie. The top-down denuclearization approach of the Trump administration uh, is, is likely uh, gone for now. And you have now uh, an incoming group of advisors and administration officials who are aware that the tensions in U.S.-China relations make it more difficult to coordinate with China on important issues such as the North Korea nuclear issue. So they're going to be trying to deal with these interactions and interconnections. From what I hear from people in this uh, new administration, the Singapore summit was uh, a problematic event insofar as it led to China easing up on pressure on North Korea uh, before North Korea really produced any meaningful uh, or concrete steps toward denuclearization or improvements in human rights. And trying to repair or reassemble the US-China coordination vis-a-vis -vis Pyongyang is going to be difficult, not only because of all the tensions between Washington and Beijing, but because in the interim, Xi Jinping has strengthened relations with Kim Jong-un. So I think what we're going to see in uh, the new administration is a bit more traditional diplomacy in trying to leverage uh, foreign policy, institutions, uh, working level talks, alliances, and, uh, and multilateral approaches to try to deal with uh, North Korea and many other uh, foreign policy challenges. But while that sounds like it may bring opportunities for increased coordination over the previous uh, administration, I would stress that moving from a top-down approach that basically came from the White House to a more all-of-government approach and multilateral approach is going to mean that there could be different points of friction that we didn't see in the last four years. For example, I expect that there will be more intra-agency disagreements in the United States and more congressional opposition. And so this makes uh, you know, the issue a hard one to move forward. And this is challenging from the perspective here in Seoul when there's such an urgency here because of domestic politics and because of fears that Pyongyang will return to a cycle of provocation if it does not see large enough carrots. So what we're waiting for is the actual implementation and rollout of what Biden's promised principled diplomacy will mean in practice. And I think what that means is that the United States will not turn a blind eye to North Korea's human rights abuses, uh, but it will also put security interests above political expediency. And that means that there'll probably be smoother cost-sharing negotiations uh, between the Republic of Korea and the United States with a special measures agreement to be concluded hopefully in, in the next month or two. 
And we are no longer expecting some sort of precipitous or uncoordinated uh, drawdown in US forces. At the same time, not, not prioritizing political expediency means that this new administration is not going to be in the deal-making mode of uh, rushing up con transfer or limiting missile defense cooperation uh, out of uh, deference to China. And so there could be some important issues here that need to be coordinated between uh, the allies. I do believe that the new administration will stick to the objective of denuclearization, but it may be willing, more willing than the previous administration, to explore some interim agreement that exchanges sanctions relief for a freeze in fissile material production. And I think this is just a recognition of the reality that Pyongyang is extremely unlikely to give up its nuclear weapons anytime soon. And in the meantime, a cap on North Korea's nuclear program could help uh, limit a rising threat. It's very difficult to assess the situation uh, in North Korea, but there are those who argue that recent disasters, pandemic border restrictions, and other forms of economic stress in North Korea may be serious enough to elicit their willingness to come back to the negotiating table. And with that willingness, if it exists, there would be a Biden administration that is, I think, more willing to engage in a phagist approach than Trump's big deals uh, or maximum pressure and summit diplomacy. But on this point, uh, I think it's very important to emphasize that North Korea has domestic politics too. Obviously, members of Biden's foreign policy team are interested in uh, resurrecting the JCPOA with Tehran. That seems to be a foreign policy uh, priority. And there are those within the administration who believe that the Iran nuclear deal can offer lessons to uh, a, a deal with North Korea. But if you look at North Korea's domestic politics, the Kim regime doesn't see it that way. It's going to demand that North Korea be treated as a nuclear state and not just one with breakout potential like Iran. And as much as the Biden administration may be in favor of diplomacy, it will not be able to disregard the causes and effects of maximum pressure politics over recent years and just pick up where Barack Obama left off on Iran or where Bill Clinton left off on North Korea. So when we look inside North Korea's domestic politics, we see that they're having a lot of high-level internal meetings uh, that suggest to me that there is now a concentration on domestic issues. And during the pandemic, uh, North Korea has actually looked to tighten uh, the government grip on the economy, not only with heavy border restrictions, but also crackdowns on so-called anti-socialist activities. There's very little in terms of people, goods, or ideas getting in and out of North Korea right now, although it's not zero. Um, it's certainly a, uh, an, a more isolated situation than before the pandemic. And engaging North Korea will be very difficult until North Korea makes the domestic political uh, decision to begin to relieve itself of its increased self-isolation. And even when you know, there are vaccines uh, available, today uh, vaccines are, are starting to roll out here in South Korea, in my country that has had a much more serious uh, suffering from the coronavirus, the vaccine uh, program is actually making leaps and bounds. But even once you know, the vaccine is, is much, much more internationally available and we start to see uh, hopefully this COVID-19 pandemic begin to abate, it's not like North Korea is just gonna open its borders to the world, right? This is a regime that's fixated on control and it is a country that is designed to have a very high tolerance for pain. And while North Korea is also receiving subsistence support from Beijing, it doesn't appear to be particularly willing or interested in uh, accepting assistance from South Korea or the United States in the name of engagement. So I think what we're seeing now is North Korea is going to wrap up its winter military exercises 
uh, successfully in its, its own accounting, despite the anti-epidemic and resource constraints. And it's going to continue to focus on domestic issues until um, it makes a choosing of a time of provocation, uh, probably next month or sometime thereafter, to see what benefits can be extracted from the new Biden administration, and perhaps to use US ROK defense exercises as an excuse to make a test of its own. And what's very concerning about this is not just that North Korea continues to advance its military capabilities, which we know, but that instead of embracing international cooperation and market forces, uh, what we see is a North Korea that appears to be doubling down on nationalist self-reliance and state-led economics. And here I'd like to stress that for those of us who watched the Eighth Party Congress closely, there were not very many good signs that came out of that major North Korean political event. The Eighth Party Congress was expected to correct policy mistakes and to spur economic growth in the country. This is how it was advertised uh, by the North Korean media in the lead up to the January uh, 2021 meeting. But Kim did not announce any of the hard choices necessary for economic development. He did not identify any pet projects that would be abandoned in order to focus on key infrastructure. And his institutional personnel, title changes, and all the rest do not account uh, or amount to economic reform. Rather, it appears that uh, this regime in North Korea is refusing to recommit to denuclearization as a way of negotiating sanctions relief, and instead overtly planning to expand its nuclear arsenal and delivery capabilities. But, and this is I think an important but, where we see a potential window for negotiation, given how North Korea will likely struggle with the technologies and costs of everything on Kim's wish list that he enumerated at the Eighth Party Congress, it may be that Pyongyang is going to take the strategy of trying to extort international payments in order to pause their nuclear development at the current stage. And this is obviously a hypothesis worth testing. Meanwhile, North Korea's trade lifeline over the border with China is on life support because of the COVID-19 restrictions that I mentioned, but it appears to be dealing with that somewhat by shifting some commerce from land to sea in order to subject uh, the ships to strict quarantine at ports. Now, if Kim wanted to give his economy a shot in the arm, he would accept as many vaccines as possible from COVAX, from China, from South Korea, from everywhere, and then relax some of the border restrictions. But I think he's unlikely to announce such a policy, although it may be partially uh, implemented under the radar. He's unlikely to explicitly embrace such a policy, because it would contradict the anti-epidemic measures that North Korea has taken domestically, for which Kim is taking credit. It would contradict self-reliance nationalism, and it would possibly contradict efforts to reassert state control over the economy. What really gets Kim's attention is when more information from the outside world penetrates into North Korea, and when North Korea withholds economic benefits. But just now, uh, those uh, threats are not increasing to the Kim regime. And as the Biden administration rolls out its Asia policy, I think it's gonna find that the problems of a threatening North Korea and an uncooperative China are closely related. Now, one other point about the Eighth Party Congress. At the end, there was, of course, uh, another military parade. And I think that the focus on the submarine launched ballistic missiles in the post-Congress uh, parade show that rather than giving up or trading away its nuclear arsenal, North Korea is probably focused on working on making it more survivable. And that for South Korea is a very bad start to 2021 because Kim was showing all this military kit uh, that uh, obviously threatens South Korea and mentioned others such as tactical nuclear weapons that foreshadow provocative tests and significant threats to South Korean national security all while Kim is unilaterally demanding that Seoul cease defense exercises and procurement with Washington, which is a blatant attempt to try to drive a wedge in the alliance. Now, in just a couple of minutes I have left, let me try to look forward a bit to where the policy trajectories are headed. Obviously, the United States is gonna be engrossed in pandemic recovery 
for much of the rest of the year. However, North Korea is going to refuse to be left on the back burner and may respond to anything resembling strategic patience with more missiles. In the meantime, I think the Biden administration, while it's working on its plan for North Korea, is going to try to exert a bit more pressure on allies to coordinate, and that includes uh, suggesting to allies that uh, security cooperation be the focus and some of the historical issues that have divided Korea and Japan, for example, be managed uh, on a uh, separate track. And that's perhaps something we can get to in, in Q&A or discussion. Meanwhile, the Moon administration vis-a-vis -vis North Korea, I think, could stand to increase attention on the surveillance and transparency of North Korea's human rights condition. Knowing that the Biden administration isn't going to take the Moon administration far outside of its comfort uh, zone on these issues, because the Biden administration is not going to follow the Trump pattern of using human rights to bludgeon Pyongyang and then bury the issue uh, for the sake of a supposed nuclear and a missile testing freeze. So I think what the Allies can do is they can sort of set a minimum standard with which by they'll talk about North Korean human rights and address the issue in international organizations like the United Nations, but lead with the carrot of humanitarian cooperation. All the while making clear that the United States and South Korea are not going to compromise alliance assets like defensive exercises just for the purpose of pleasing Pyongyang. I think that the United States administration now can also look to coordinate very closely with South Korea on what some future sanctions exemptions might look like so that Seoul can reach out to the North with some credible cooperation, say, with a partial reopening of the Mount Kumgang Resort for separated family reunions or individual uh, tourist uh, visits. I think South Korea would also be well within its interest to try to push forward the comprehensive military agreement with North Korea, trying to set up that promised inter-Korean joint military committee, and expanding the CMA's uh, cessation of hostile acts to include cyber attacks. Now let me just conclude by saying that the Trump administration sharpened focus on China's capabilities and assertiveness, disabusing the world that the United States would take care of their China challenges for them. Now, the Biden administration is going to be much more alliance-focused and multilateral cooperative, but it's also going to expect U.S. allies to align their strategies to defend the rules-based order, standards for trade, technology, freedom of navigation, and human rights. So I think it's important that the U.S. and South Korea expeditiously start to work together, whether that's on WTO reform or thinking about joining the TPP or Seoul, um, if not explicitly, working closer with the Quad in a sort of Quad Plus arrangement than at least deepening regional cooperation via the U.S. ROK alliance and South Korea's new southern policy. I think this would be a very prudent approach to take the maintenance of the alliance first, uh, make sure that the alliance can deter North Korea, then patch up relations with Tokyo to get on the same page for dealing with China, and then work from a position of strength to persuade Pyongyang to avoid provocations and return to working level talks. U.S. alliances serve as the building blocks for regional security in Asia, and Seoul is the necessary leader for how the world can productively deal with North Korea. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, uh, Professor Isli, for such a very detailed but uh, comprehensive and excellent presentation. And I think uh, towards the end of your presentation, you talked about uh, Biden administration's kind of desire to have a better coordination among its alliance partners in the region. And I think that that leads to very nicely to our second presentation. Uh, Professor uh, Sakata Yasuo from the Kanda University of International Uni uh, Studies. Uh, she will talk about uh, revisiting US-Japan-Korea trilateral cooperation and task in the Biden era. So uh, I'm very... Uh, Glad to uh, you know have uh, Professor uh, Sakata here again. Uh, good to see you. Uh, can you hear me clearly, by the way? Yes, Can you hear me? Yes, very okay. nice. So thank okay. you so much again for your time. And uh, so mm -hmm. please, uh, the floor is yours again. Another uh, 15 to 20 minutes for presentation. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, hello from Tokyo. And uh, first of all. 
I would like to express my thanks to the um, uh, KAIST President, um, Chun Jae Song, and the um, Korean Association of International Studies uh, to, for inviting me to this um, special seminar, uh, international seminar. Uh, and uh, arigatou gozaimasu. Uh, and um, I also like to thank uh, uh, Professor Fan Chifan for his uh, warm support uh, as executive director. Also, um, I am delighted to participate in this panel, uh, moderated by um, uh, Professor Shin Song Ho. Uh, I, I really appreciate um, getting together, uh, connecting online uh, with you, and um, also the other experts on this panel. Um, thank you also to Professor Lee for becoming uh, being the discussant for my uh, paper. So um, I'd just like to give a short version of uh, my paper. Uh, basically, um, my talk will be uh, threefold. Um, why uh, I chose trilateral cooperation and also how I see the state of the situation now and, um, and lastly, tasks ahead in the Biden era. So why did I choose um, US ROK Japan trilateral cooperation? Um, so I was asked to give a talk something about Japan um, in the context of the theme of this panel. And uh, North Korea is certainly a top priority issue, but um, I uh, decided to focus, uh, I chose to focus on US alliance policy, which is an element that, you know, undergards all policies that Japan and South Korea uh, makes. And I could have, instead of focusing on the US-Japan alliance as a cornerstone and US-ROK alliance as a, uh, as a linchpin, I just chose to simply focus on the trilateral US-ROK-Japan cooperation, um, which is going to be one of the highlights um, in the Biden's um, alliance policy. So Professor Easley um, gave a presentation about the alliance uh, and North Korea. And I basically agree with what um, he said. And I would also emphasize that the Biden team will focus not only on rebuilding bilateral alliances, but will also seek to utilize mini multilaterals or coalitions. And developing the new quad uh, will be a priority, but also reinstating the US ROK Japan um, trilateral will be another feature in that strategy. Um, I think the Biden team uh, with the Secretary Blinken and uh, Mr. Campbell and all the, the Asia Pacific team, um, they will do so in order to build what can be called a, um, an Indo-Pacific alliance network, or some might say pivot to or rebalance to. So um, also another reason is that uh, that I focus on trilateral cooperation is that this trilateral has been unfortunately been very strained or damaged in the past few years, um, unfortunately due to the poor state of Korea-Japan um, diplomatic relations, as well as the lax alliance management on the U.S. side uh, due mainly to the former president's approach. But we all know that um, it's, it's not a very popular topic in South Korea, um, but nor is it so in Japan recently. Um, there are political sensitivities in Korea, but even in Japan, uh, due to recent events, it has become increasingly difficult to talk about this issue. But that said, um, sentiments aside, there is a, uh, a strong strategic necessity to engage this issue again. Um, strategic challenges not only the North Korean nuclear challenge, but the China challenge and beyond lie ahead. And the Biden administration is set on rebuilding the alliance network. Um, so it is incumbent upon the US allies, Japan and South Korea to seize this opportunity to respond proactively to America's outreach and align ourselves for the sake of our own national interest to bring America back. So second part is, um, so how does the situation look regarding trilateral cooperation? Um, it doesn't look that great at this moment, um, but it's not a lost cause. And here I would like to highlight the impact of the GSAMIA crisis uh, back in uh, 2019, um, when it was almost terminated, but not. And that crisis really um, rocked the boat. Um, I think it was a wake up call for the security policy community that you know, trilateral cooperation cannot be taken for granted. 
Um, so for the first time, um, history and politics uh, really adversely affected security and economic ties. I think it was an inflection point in the history of trilateral cooperation, which calls for self-reflection self, um, among the three parties. But as a whole, um, the crisis showed both um, the fragility or the vulnerability of, of, of the um, trilateral ties, but, as well, but also the resilience of the trilateral. It showed how the situation can get out of control uh, with poor alliance management and policy coordination. But in the end, the U.S. stepped in strongly and Korea-Japan aligned itself. Uh, in the end, um, defense logic prevailed, uh, fortunately, and GSAMIA and trilateral was um, kept intact. But the trilateral as of today still rests on shaky ground. Uh, the GSAMIA crisis showed the cracks within the trilateral and they need to be addressed. So how do the US, ROK and Japan view the trilateral? Um, I summed it up in the following way. Uh, the US is um, the most strategically, the most steady uh, on, the, on the trilateral um, and, and, and has an intent to strengthening it, but also very frustrated with Korea-Japan relations. Um, there was a resolution that the U.S. Congress passed on GSAMIA uh, back in November of 2019, and it sent the message to the two allies that GSAMIA and trilateral is important, um, and urged the Korea-Japan to work out the issues and insulate defense ties from other issues. ROK, as I understand it, is known for its ambiguity or caution on uh, trilateral, but does support it. I think it's worth noting that in 2017, um, President Moon Jae-in um, acknowledged the importance of security cooperation with not only the U.S. but also Japan uh, in a uh, Channel News, um, Channel Asia News interview in Singapore. But he was cautious about it and emphasized that it should be limited to North Korea, uh, but and that it should not be a formal military alliance, quote unquote. But here I would like to also highlight Japan's situation. Um, Japan has been steady and is steady on the support for trilateral cooperation, despite the rocky Korea-Japan relationship. Japan knows that the trilateral is an enabler for the U.S.-Japan alliance. Uh, we are not seeking an, a formal military alliance um, as well, um, but it is an enabler for both the U.S.-Japan and U.S.-Korea alliances. But underneath, um, there is some more caution and more uneasiness, uh, uh, which is increasing within the Japanese security community. And there are two reasons. One is that North Korea, uh, the nuclear missile threat, um, has increased uh, to well, basically cover the Japanese territory. An official threat assessment in 20, um, changed in 2017 and 18 that the North Korean program, nu missile, nuclear missile program, are a grave and imminent threat, quote, quote unquote. Um, so though we are ready to provide uh, rear area support in a Korea contingency, um, there is still there is um, less, uh, I would say, enthusiasm or, or caution, more caution about getting entangled in a Korean, uh, in, in, um, in the Korean Peninsular um, security. Second is the deteriorating situation in Korea-Japan relations um, and the, um, the, the defense incidents between uh, uh, the uh, self-defense forces and the, the Korean uh, Navy and also the GSAMIA shock in 20, 2019. Uh, a poll um, by the East Asia Institute and Gennong NPO, which they conduct joint um, polls every year. Uh, the 2019 and 2020 polls show that actually there's less support um, for trilateral cooperation among the Japanese, which is about 40%, compared to the Korean opinions, uh, which is about 66% or 60 to 50%. So this kind of shows the uneasiness uh, in, in Japan as well. So despite this, the Japanese government and defense officials still, clear, uh, still show clear support for the trilateral 
for the sake of the alliance and the alliance network. But the uneasiness or insecurity, not only on the Korean side, but also on the Japanese side, should be kept in mind in, um, when we uh, re-engage alliance management. So lastly, um, tasks, uh, I would like to mention um, some tasks ahead for the trilateral cooperation in the Biden era. So we have yet to see how um, the U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy and Korea policy will evolve, but reinstating U.S.-Korea-Japan trilateral cooperation will be part of, um, as, as a part of the network of alliances, uh, will be important component in the Biden um, strategy. So overall, um, in the aftermath of the G-Samia crisis, political fragilities and insecurities in the relationship need to be addressed. But at the same time, trilateral cooperation needs to be updated to the strategic realities of today. And it cannot be, it can no longer be just security cooperation in the narrow sense, but needs to evolve into a broader strategic cooperation um, about North Korea, but beyond North Korea, um, responding to the China challenge and, and further on. So in this context, I, in the paper, I, I highlighted three areas, the alliance, military and defense, and economy. Um, just briefly, I'll touch upon them. Uh, first, um, alliance security and alliance management. This is important because, as I said, uh, as, sh as manifested in the G-Samia crisis of 2019, we need to um, lessen the uncertainty and um, make this uh, political relationship more stable uh, in managing this relationship. Um, and there are many things I'd like to address, but um, I'll just focus on one point. The U.S. Global Posture Review is, is, has started, and um, it provides an opportunity for U.S., Korea, and Japan to re-engage each other and consult and coordinate on the present and future of the uh, two alliances and trilateral cooperation. And it should be embedded into the Indo-Pacific scheme. And regular diplomatic and defense dialogue should be promoted, um, and informal linkages with the Quad can be discussed. And second, um, military and defense or security cooperation. Um, there's many issues, but North Korea is, is still on the top of the agenda for the trilateral cooperation. Here also the U.S. North Korea Policy Review will provide an opportunity for Biden, uh, as Leaf said, is its alliance first. Uh, that's, that is the underlying principle for North Korea policy. So policy coordination with South Korea and Japan is the first step. And so these several months will be critical. And, um, and on the agenda should be uh, deterrence and defense, um, uh, re, um, re, uh, looking, at, looking over the uh, missile defense uh, um, cooperation, um, and also um, diplomatic efforts in terms of pressure and dialogue. Um, for denuclearization uh, to reduce the North Korean threat, a nuclear threat. And lastly, uh, third is the, uh, a new area of um, economic security and cooperation in the Indo-Pacific and globally. Um, for example, just um, this week, President Biden signed an executive order to um, conduct a review to secure supply chains of um, strategic industries and material and will engage allies, um, including Japan and South Korea, and, and Europe, and Europe, by the way. <laughs> and so um, strategic um, economic dialogue and cooperation will be an important tool. And U.S.-Japan and U.S.-Korea dialogues will, is go, will go on, but also, but still, Japan and South Korea is still the missing link. We have not been able to um, connect into the Indo-Pacific um, strategy with um, South Korea's North, uh, new Southern policy and so forth. So that's, uh, that would be on the agenda. And in doing so, Japan and South Korea will need to overcome the export control issue. And Japan needs to be proactive on this front. Uh, that's my opinion. And there are Japanese experts on economic and te technology security that advocate engagement with um, emerging tech powers like South Korea and Taiwan. And Japan and South Korea should be keen on seizing up the opportunity to solve the issue. That is all for my talk. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, uh, Professor Sakada, for your another very interesting and uh, timely uh, presentation. Uh, the next, uh, our final uh, presenter, uh, Professor Kim Hin Han uh, from Yihua Women's University. Uh, he will talk about the Biden administration's policy towards North Korea and South Korea's policy strategy towards the United States, which in and itself is another very interesting topic. So, Professor Kim, uh, you have uh, about 15 to 20 minutes. Thank you. So, my name is Inhan Kim, Associate Professor of Political Science Department at Yihua Women's University. I'm privileged, I'm privileged to be a part of this conference, and I'd like to thank uh, for Professor Chen Jae-sung and Huang Ji-hwan uh, for organizing uh, this great um, conference, and I thank for um, Professor Shin uh, for presiding over uh, this panel. Um, I have three issues to address through my presentation. Uh, first, what Biden's North Korean policy would look like. Um, second, what opportunities and constraints the arrival of the Biden administration offers to Seoul's vision for building peace regime on the Korean Peninsula. And third, what Seoul needs to do. <clears throat> Let me start from uh, Biden's Ad Biden administ administration's North Korean policy. Previous administrations in Washington um, had their own signature North Korean policy. Um, Obama's um, term is known with the um, strategic patience, and Trump is known for maximum pressure. Uh, for Biden, we don't know it yet. His North Korean policy is yet to take a form. A comprehensive review of the previous policies is on the way, uh, but we can infer what a Biden's foreign policy would look like with the statements of the president and key members of his, his foreign policy team have made in the past few years. Four things call for attention. First, Biden wants complete, verifiable, and reversible denuclearization of North Korea. He stressed this one throughout his campaign trail. Second, the mix of economic sanctions and efforts to promote diplomacy will remain in place. This is the approach previous administrations have all shared. So Biden and his foreign policy team understand that there is no other viable option. So the first two indicate that Biden is on the same page with his predecessor, Donald Trump, in dealing with North Korea. But here are important differences. Biden's approach will be different from that of Trump uh, in that Biden prefers a more silenced and disciplined approach than the previous president. So future contact with North Korea will be bottom up rather than top down. Biden will start working level um, negotiations, empowering his bureaucrats and utilizing their expertise they accumulated for the past decades. And another difference is Biden wants to be realistic. Trump style, big deal, swapping CVID and lifting whole sanctions overnight is unlikely. Biden cannot ignore reality any longer. That is, Pyongyang has established uh, itself as a nuclear state over the past 15 years, and Kim Jong-un has no appetite for giving up his nuclear arsenal willingly. Blinken, Anthony Blinken, Biden's pick for his Secretary of State, has occasionally suggested that Washington should look more to arms control than unlikely denuclearization. He once put, quote start, the hard reality is it's, if not impossible, highly unlikely that we will achieve in any near term the complete denuclearization of North Korea. I just don't see that as realistic in the near term. What I think we can get is an arms control and over time disarmament process put in place, quote end. 
The statement indicates two possible courses of action from the Biden administration. The one is that he is unlikely to return to the strategic patience of the Obama administration in which he served as a vice president. North Korea now possesses way further advanced nuclear capabilities compared with the ones when Biden left the White House four years ago. Another is that his policy to contain the North Korean nuclear threat will be like an Iran-style arms control deal. So it will involve a multilateral approach, calling for cooperation among parties with interest in the issue. That will include American regional allies and probably, China, definitely China as well. Furthermore, it will involve multiple phases till the completion of denuclearization entailing exchanges between what Washington wants versus what Pyongyang wants in each step toward the final goal. Then the second topic, what are the opportunities and challenges uh, Mr. Moon Jae-in administration sees with the arrival of the Biden administration? Mr. Moon Jae-in, the incumbent South Korean president, has worked hard to improve relations with the North. Under the name of the Korean Peninsula peace process, he has aimed at ending the Korean War officially by replacing the existing ceasefire with a peace treaty signed by relevant parties. The second is restoring inter-Korean economy relations. Mr. Moon believes that North Korean nuclear standoff can be resolved only when Pyongyang sees its external environment as benign Nothing could be surer, nothing could be surer way than officially ending the Korean War and making peace treaty. He also believes that the international community needs to relax the tight economic sanctions imposed on North Korea as a gesture to encourage Kim Jong-un's difficult, bold step towards denuclearization. Trump's preferences for dramatic diplomacy, partly, help the Korean Peninsula peace process get off the ground, then what would the return of Mr. Biden to the White House mean for Moon's vision for the lasting peace regime on the peninsula? There are at least two bright sides to bright aspects. The first positive sign is the United States turned to a phase approach from a big deal. If Washington and Pyongyang agrees with a small steps from arms control to dismantlement and exchange favors for each steps, Seoul will be able to see a window of opportunities for improving inter-Korean relations open up. Second, Biden has pledged to restore multilateralism and revive the alliance partnership in resolving international crisis. Then, it means the United States will channel its policies with its partners, seriously listening to their ideas and preferences. It means Seoul will have great opportunities to put in its opinions in the process of Washington's policy formulation and implementation. But challenges lying ahead of Seoul are formidable as well. The first challenge is deep rooted suspicion that Biden and his foreign policy team have against Pyongyang. As vice president during the Obama administration, Biden himself observed Pyongyang violating the Leap Day Agreement. Anthony Blinken has been a supporter of building genuine economic pressure to squeeze North Korea to get it to the negotiating table and he has often called Kim Jong-un as one of the worst tyrants in the world. What about Wendy Sherman, the new Deputy Secretary of the State Department? She's also another well-known hardliner against Pyongyang with a rich experience in dealing with North Korea dating back to the Clinton administration. The second challenge is the Biden foreign policy team is conducting review of North Korean policy now and Mr. Moon Jae-in has urged the Biden administration to come up with a comprehensive plan uh, for North Korea promptly, but it will take time. This is not an encouraging sign for Mr. Moon Jae-in. Why? Washington will not rush. 
and the North Korean issue, honestly, it's not the most pressing, urgent issue on the part of Washington. Mr. Moon Jae-in has just 15 months. He has less than 15 months till the end of his term, and time is clicking, and it is not on his side. The third challenge is related to the intensifying U.S.-China rivalry. The United States, U.S.-China relations has been deteriorating throughout the Trump presidency, and Trump identified China as a strategic competitor, and he shaped consensus in Congress and the public that China is not just a competitor, but also a threat to American global leadership. And Biden has shared the Trump as assessment of China as an authoritarian rival intent on disrupting the American-led global order. So the hard line that the United States has taken in recent years is likely to stay under the new Biden administration. Biden has pledged to counter Beijing's expanding global influences with U.S. allies. And Washington's call for Seoul to join the anti-China alignment is growing strong. Invitations to join the Summit for Democracy and the Quad will arrive soon, and Seoul has been reluctant to accept invitation in any coalitions against Beijing. It has adopted strategic ambiguities between the PLC and the United States for a long time, but the ambiguity is unlikely to sustainable. Given the security ties for the past seven decades, it will be challenging for Seoul to ignore continuing calls from Washington but it will be very difficult dilemma to distance from Beijing as China is the largest trading partner and it has crucial leverage over Pyongyang and in worst case, China can be a spoiler in the uh, peace process on the Korean Peninsula. Then the last but not least, what so should do? I would like to make two recommendations for Seoul's strategy toward Washington. Actually, one, uh, one for the young Washington and one for Seoul itself. First, Seoul should make the best use of uh, voice opportunities that the Biden's pledge to restore multilateralism and alliance partnership will offer. By so doing, it should promote a mutual understanding in the key issues of South Korea's foreign relations. Seoul should be able to persuade Washington to be proactive in North Korean issue. It is too important to be ranked low in the priority list of U.S. foreign policy. It should form consensus with Washington in advance in the matters of what incentives to offer when nuclear diplomacy resumes and what punishment to apply to Pyongyang in case nuclear diplomacy backpedals. For China policy, Seoul should clearly deliver what it can do against Beijing and what it cannot. It should be able to tell Washington that Seoul will remain as a faithful and proud ally of the United States for both regional and global affairs, but that it is impossible to antagonize China because of geographic proximity, economic interdependence, and North Korean issue. For Japan, so should ask Washington to behave more seriously, to mend relations with Tokyo. And it is time for Seoul to review and reset its foreign relations toward major powers around the Korean Peninsula. Seoul should be aware that Washington is watching Seoul with concerns and suspicion, and Washington is nervous that Seoul is getting too close to Beijing, that its relations with Tokyo has become very sour, and that is rushing to resume economic relations with the North despite the absence of meaningful progress in Pyongyang's denuclearization. And Washington is taking a pause and examining its, uh, its policy toward the Korean Peninsula. Seoul should take a moment and review what it has achieved and what it has lost for the past four years. It is certainly a time to get prepared for a foreign policy strategy post-moon era. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kim, uh, for another very interesting, excellent presentation on the challenges lies ahead for both uh, Washington and Seoul in dealing with all those difficult security issues on the Korean Peninsula. We have uh, uh, three uh, very distinguished uh, panel for uh, discussion. 
And uh, first, uh, we have uh, Dr. Kim uh, Jina, Jina Kim uh, from Korea Institute for Defense Analysis. Uh, you have about uh, seven to 10 minutes for your discussion. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Um, I really thank the organizer for inviting me today. Um, I'm very glad to be part of this panel, and I really enjoy all the presentations. Well, I'm supposed to make some comments on Professor Eastley's uh, presentation, um, so I was thinking, if Trump, pr President Trump got reelected with the policy toward North Korea or US policy on uh, rock US alliance have changed dramatically. I, I kind of doubt about that because the US policy um, on North Korea has been very much consistent so far. So far means including the time uh, under President Trump. Well, any deal, any deal reached between the two sides should go through the US Congress. And the same scrutiny should be applied to any uh, negotiation product. And the White House, the State Department, uh, under the President Trump administration that uh, emphasize that um, actually three things. Um, no tolerance to provocation and early uh, returning to the negotiation for a denuclearization. And the denuclearization should be very, very comprehensive. So um, there's nothing new about it. And we heard, have heard about these demands many, many times before. Um, well, so, so what I'm saying is um, the US policy toward North Korea has uh, will, will continue to be very consistent. Um, the only the change that was made in the past was how to negotiate with the North Koreans. But the same thing uh, was true about what to negotiate with North Korea. So we have been and uh, will be working on mutual interest between the two allies regarding North Korea issues. And I don't think that cost sharing, for example, issue will shake the foundation of the rock US alliance, especially the alliance structure. USFK is part of the global overseas troops and is the crucial part of the US global strategy. And the USFK, for example, reduction in 1990 was canceled because of the geopolitical uh, dynamics and the significant significance of the rock us uh, alliance here in this region. Only the transformation of the US global strategy, not cost sharing issues, uh, actually affects the alliance structure. Um, I think um, at, according to uh, many documents um, issued by the US Department, um, uh, of defense. Well, the, the key factors that can change the alliance is such as uh, the missions and roles in this region and uh, the benefits of stationing troops here in, in South Korea and the threat in this region. Currently, the USFK serves to counterbalance the rising China. So what I'm saying is the overall context is the same. So. In the coming years, I think the two sides should uh, work on some you know, mutual interest and overlapping uh, areas of interest, such as uh, overlaps between Indo-Pacific strategy and South Korea's new Southern policy, as uh, Professor Easley mentioned, and also between, uh, overlaps between strategic flexibility that the US government is very much interested in regarding the future of uh, the USFK and Afghan transfer that the South, Korean is, South Koreans are very much interested in. Also, the, the overlaps between peace regime on the Korean Peninsula and developing global partnership between the two allies. There are so many things that we uh, uh, have uh, much interest in. And now that the leadership in, uh, in Washington changed and North Korea is not obviously, uh, the number one foreign policy priority uh, of the Biden administration. I, I think um, not just because the North Korean issue is insignificant, but because it is not a timely urgent. 
So many argue that um, perhaps North Korea will return to uh, previous vicious cycle starting from military provocation on the Korean Peninsula, then what? Well, um, but I have a slight different ideas because provocation uh, is tried when there is a political gain, right? And, and any, like uh, any other countries, North Korea should uh, be concerned about the balance between cost and benefits from you know, provocation. Uh, for example, um, well, satellite launch um, is also a violation of the UN, UN Security Council resolution. It can be uh, one of the provocation options that North Korea has in mind, but that's not going to be easy because the Security Council resolution bans any testing using um, ballistic missile technology, and they're going to be very automatic uh, meeting at the UN Security Council level, and all should convene to discuss what to uh, do uh, to put more pressure on North Korea. That's inevitable. And if North Korea conducts a satellite launch, for example, to increase ISR capabilities, let, let's, let's just forget, forget about the political um, motivation. But what if there is a technical motivation? motivation? What matters for North Korea is not just a launcher, but uh, also the satellite technology itself as well. So in this regard, they need to develop um, remote sensing, data reception, technology, interception, and uh, interpretation, and observation applica applications, etc. So it, it'll take time. What about SLBM? Well, these kind of tests uh, uh, from a new nuclear uh, power submarine can actually uh, you know, attract international attention, obviously. But building a new submarine will also take time. So I'm talking about the time frame. So I'm saying that North Korea may, in the future, think about this kind of high-profile provocation, but not now. And it will rather subdivide actions toward high-profile provocations like that. And in this regard, interactions between North Korea and the rest of the world will matter. And if North Korea intends to speed up military, uh, military modernization for political purposes or military purposes, North Korea needs time. It needs to buy time to spend more money on developing uh, its weapon system. Without managing stable environment on the Korean Peninsula, it cannot do, do it. It cannot do it. It has to continue to stay, have a stable environment, not to antagonize either China or Russia. Because it is vital for the North Koreans to keep uh, closer ties with China and Russia for many, many reasons. Obviously, to uh, defend any move initiated by the US to put more pressure on North Korea because of development of these kind of new technologies. And also, um, according to Russia's custom office recently, Russia's import of export of I'm sorry export of uh, strategic items in the name in the title of national security matters to sell, uh, to North Korea increased very dramatically, and North Korea's reliance on uh, China when it comes to strategic trade, the trade of banned items or dubious items, well. It's significant. North Korea's reliance on China is over 90% in that regard. So in order to build more arms for military modernization, North Korea needs time and needs a very stable environment. So I, I think we are at a crossroad. My takeaway from the eight-party Congress was uh, such that North Korea still values the Singapore summit. It, it uh, regarded as a monumental historical moment in the history of world politics. And North Korea views the, its relations with the US is very, very critical because it says, well, the only obstacle to build a socialist country on the, on the Korean Peninsula is its contention uh, with the US. That means it has to solve any problem between the two countries in the future to have a, a strong socialist country in the North. So North Korea knows that.
And also, North Korea uh, proposed the two different pathways on the Korean Peninsula. One was arms racing, and another was uh, military um, confidence building. So um, I think, well, at this point at least, because of the self-introduced sanctions uh, because of the COVID-19 quarantine measures in North Korea, the economy is suffering a lot. And um, if we do nothing at all, then North Korea's reliance on other countries like China and Russia will certainly increase. That's not, that does not serve our national interest. Well, um, it, so my question uh, to uh, Professor Easley is, well, what, still there is a chance for us to have a dialogue with the North Koreans. So on what terms can North Korea return to the negotiation table? And if that is not uh, a, a immediate option, then when can we expect North Korea will begin a vicious cycle of provocation? Certainly, CPX, uh, the command post exercise, is not visible at all. I've been there many, many times. So it is no point of, for North Koreans, there's no point of arguing that it is a, a, a provocative action at all. CPX is computer uh, scenario-based exercise. Um, so, um, North Korea may not use the joint exercise in uh, March as a, a reason to escalate tension on the Korean Peninsula. That, that alone is not uh, really a, a good reason for North Korea's making provocation uh, at the highest level. So, uh, as long as the Biden administration is, talk, is, is considering practical step-by-step -step approach toward the denuclearization, then, well, I, and if this, the South Korean government and the U.S. government are trying to send a signal that the dialogue is still out there as an option, then we may have to think about more practical measures like uh, concrete roadmap, including verification measures, etc. So in the meantime, what, uh, can, what should be done and what can be done, in your opinion? Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kim, uh, for your interesting comment. Next, I'd like to invite uh, Professor uh, Chong Han Lee, uh, Lee Chong Han from uh, Seoul National University, who teaches uh, Japanese uh, politics and foreign policy. Uh, Professor Lee. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Shin. Well, my name is Chong Han Lee, now working for Seoul National University. The, as Professor Shin introduced, the, I mainly studied the Japanese politics and the Japanese foreign policy. So I, today I was assigned to discussion to the, the Professor Sakada's paper. Uh, I highly enjoyed the Sakada's Sensei's paper. The, it is very interesting and then timely, and then provide the excellent explanation on the current the problem and then prospect of the three countries' the trilateral relations. I fully agree with the Professor Sakada's point. The, her concept, maybe U.S. frustration, the Korea's the ambiguity, and then Japan's uneasiness, the highly relevant in explaining the difficult situation of the, the trilateral cooperation. Uh, also, I agree with the, the Professor Sakada that even though there are the difficult diplomatic problems in the history dimension and then also economic dimension, maybe trilateral security cooperation will be back to the original track because of the Biden administration. Yeah, that's the and my the agreement with the Professor Sakada. The, the condition of the full the agreement with the Professor Sakada, I just I want to add the several some you know, the two or three the, some the comment and then question. At the first I would like to address the history and then economic dimensions, the issue between the Korea and Japan, and then move on to the security cooperation. Um, the Professor Sakada's the paper mainly focused on the security dimensions of cooperation, right? So, but the, she also suggested and mentioned that the economic cooperation issue in the final pages with the concept of the economic security. The current the Korea-Japan relations have been highly damaged, as you know. So it is the maybe like the spillover effect, and then it. 
is the trapped in the, the vicious cycle, right? Maybe the devil had been very long-lasting, unofficial principle in the Korean-Japan relations. The, maybe you are very familiar with that the phrase, the separation between politics and then economy, right? It just has the maybe it seems to, to stop working in main in, in recent years, the main in 2019. Right, the confrontation history dimension, just the transfer to the economic dimension, and then also move on to a security dimension. Right, the, the, the main task, the upgrading or some the encouraging trilateral security cooperation require, require other dimensions, the recovering, recovering the cooperation in the other dimension. Maybe, maybe Japan's the uneasiness for trilateral security cooperation, which just uh, is which is the result of the EAI and then Elon Canon MPO's survey. I think it is never originated from the unwillingness on security cooperation in Japan. They want to their security cooperation, but uh, they are they unwilling is, is from uh, originated from their history dimension, right? So this getting out uh, from vicious cycle is the became now very important, uh, urgent the task to the Korean and then Japanese the government nowadays, right? Uh, as a, the, as most of you already know, the Korean government, there are some the changes, the, the attitude to the Japanese government nowadays. So maybe it is the, because of the Biden administration, because the US administration wanted and then demanded. In this condition, maybe two governments, there are some the move in the, in the recent years. Maybe they should find a way of the starting discussion about the history issue. We cannot maybe the avoid this kind of the discussion, but the, I think this the, the discussion never means the, some the finding final settlement. We should the, maybe target kind of the, some just management, and maybe so just the management. To, and we need management, not a final solution for history dispute. That maybe should be a starting point. And then regarding economic cooperation, maybe in the, in the long perspective, that, that's true that Korea and Japan share vision for beneficial global economic governance. They are the two nations, they're, they're, uh, they, they're, they are very similar in the, their, their positioning in the global economic and the industrial structure. And then in the long term, maybe there are shared benefit in this cooperation between the Korea and Japan. But uh, I think it is now too early and too difficult to discuss bilateral cooperation for long term shared interest. I think that in, the, in the short term, maybe we should the, the Korea and Japan Maybe their some their cooperation in the economic dimension should link should be linked with their responding to Biden administration's asking for multilateral framework. That is the point. Maybe already the Professor Sakada mentioned about the CPTPP and then also some the digital economy and then infrastructure. Right, the Korean Japan economic cooperation. Should be should mean should mingle with the task of the setting multilateral framework. In this point, I want the some the, the I think the examining Japanese version in the Pacific is very meaningful. Maybe Japan is the made some the word of the Indo Pacific strategy at the first, but the Japanese government dropped the strategy in 2018 and then they used, utilized the initiative and then, but then in, the, in 2019 Japanese government also dropped the, the initiative in nowadays in the Japanese government officially just mentioned the Indo-Pacific. I think it, it can be some the, one of the, the clue to the Japanese 
I got the Korean the diplomacy to the some the Japan the with the Japan. Maybe Japan still maybe changing, changing the utilization of the Indo-Pacific is also the shows the Japan's the flexibility in the between the U.S. and then China. It's the Japan's flexibility is very important. The Japanese version of the Indo-Pacific is the highly different from the U.S. version. Maybe in the at least the final days of the Abe administration. So if the we Korean government the accept the Japanese version of the Indo-Pacific, maybe it is not difficult to maybe participate in the Indo-Pacific diplomacy in the to Korea. Maybe Korea is the maybe the Japanese version is the provided the, the easy easy way to the Korea in the participate in the Indo-Pacific diplomacy. And then I just added one more point: the the security cooperation. Maybe the trilateral security cooperation is the targeted the, the North Korea and its involvement and then. The involvement of the trilateral security cooperation is the just some the target the North Korea, but the, in the in the future, I'm not sure about the, some the how much the Korea and then Japan it, it sub, will be will be supportive to the U.S. the intention to upgrade this the trilateral cooperation security cooperation to the some the balancing. Mm tool for balancing against China. Maybe U.S. the unofficial but clear intention. United States has the maybe clear intention. But it's very uneasy to Korea, maybe, I think so. But the, I'm not sure about the Japanese the response and then calculation. And then how the Japanese calculation can be separated in this the East South East China Sea and then South China Sea. Maybe it will be it, it's the my the some the question the question to Professor Sakada, and then right uh, I used to all my time and this time here I, I will start. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Lee. Next, uh, Professor Ramon Pacheco Pardo from the King's College London who is specializing uh, in East Asian affairs, including Korean Peninsula. Please, uh, Professor Pardo. Oh, I appreciate that, especially you're joining all the way from, is it, uh, are you in London or somewhere else in Europe? I'm in London now. Okay, I hope the timing is not too bad. It's okay, it's okay. It's, it's uh, 7.45 now, so it's good to wake up early. <laughs> oh, wow, still early so, in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, thank you for <laughs> dressing up in, in such a, in an early time. But anyway, the floor is yours, please. Thank you, thank you, Anna. Hello from, from, from London, where we, we are still in, in lockdown here, so, so I'm a bit jealous that you can actually have a, a physical conference uh, in, in Korea. And it's good, it's good to see uh, friends and colleagues, uh, even if it's online. Uh, I want to thank Kais for, for the invitation to, to your conference, uh, President uh, Chun and Executive Director Huang for, for, for their invitation to, to participate in the uh, conference today. And uh, I, I hope you can enjoy some, some chimek on my behalf <laughs> after the conference in your evening time. So uh, I was assigned to uh, discuss uh, Professor Kim's paper. I, and I have to say, I found it very good, and I found myself in agreement uh, with uh, pretty much everything that was written uh, on the paper. So I decided to focus on three aspects that uh, I think will be of interest to hear Professor Kim's views, but also other panelists might have views on this. Uh, some some curveballs, because uh, I think there is an agreement about the type of policy that the Biden administration is, is likely to, to conduct. And I think there is an agreement also on the opportunities, but also the challenges for the uh, Moon administration. Uh, but uh, I think there are three issues that uh, it would be interesting to, uh, to discuss. Uh, the first point is that uh, not only Professor Kim, but other panelists have said that it seems that North Korea is going to refrain from, from big provocations uh, in the coming months. Uh, but as we all know from history, 
uh, we cannot uh, fully predict what Pyongyang's behavior is going to be. So, so uh, Professor Kim, what, what do you think would happen if, if North Korea decides to conduct an, an ICBM test or even a nuclear test? Uh, I agree with you that this is unlikely. I agree with the other panelists that this is unlikely, uh, but uh, uh, we never know. And, and we don't even know how the Biden administration might react to lower level provocations. Uh, uh, someone mentioned, for example, the possibility of a, a satellite launch. Uh, how, how is the Biden administration going to react uh, to this? So what do you think the Biden, the, sorry, the Moon government could actually do if the Biden administration, uh, if the, if the, uh, what could the Moon government do if, if North Korea conducts one of these provocations uh, and the Biden administration decides to focus on other foreign policy priorities? Uh, uh, you mentioned this in your presentation. Uh, China obviously is a much uh, bigger priority. Now we see uh, the potential resumption of GCPOA. Uh, Biden has to rebuild alliances, uh, uh, has to focus on multilateral cooperation. And, and I'm not even talking about the domestic challenges the administration uh, faces. So, so there could be the temptation for the Biden administration to say, well, look, uh, let's forget about North Korea, let them conduct the provocations and, and let's focus on on other issues that might be more important for us in the coming months and even in the first years of, of the current administration. Um, I, I think that there would still be opportunities for the Moon government to emphasize the importance of uh, North Korea, Korean Peninsula uh, stability uh, for the US policy, not only towards the Korean Peninsula itself, but towards uh, East Asia or the, or the broader Indo-Pacific. Uh, but there might be this temptation, as I mentioned, of saying, well, let's focus on other matters and not necessarily on, on, on North Korea and on, on Pyongyang. A, a second issue that I think would be interesting uh, to hear your views on, and, and maybe that, those of the other panelists as well, is uh, how do you think the Moon government would react uh, if the Biden administration takes a more transactional approach towards relations with, with South Korea? Uh, of course, there is the, the ideological affinity, there is the common history and the strength of the alliance. We all know about it and, and, and we all understand that the Biden administration is not the Trump administration. So it's going to uh, treat allies uh, with the respect uh, that they deserve, also out of US interest, of course. But uh, the Biden administration might say, well, yes, we're willing to support some sort of uh, inter-Korean uh, engagement. We're willing to follow uh, diplomacy with uh, North Korea and engagement uh, approach. But uh, in return, what about South Korea, for example, joining the Quad or the Quad Plus? Or what about launching a DTEN? I mean, there's going to be a, a G7 summit coming up actually here in the UK in June. Of course, President Summit is going to come here. Uh, President Moon is going to come here to the, uh, to the, to the summit. And some people uh, here in Europe are talking about a potential expanded G7, are talking about a potential uh, D10. And obviously, South Korea would be, uh, would be part of it, along with, with Australia and, 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 and India. Uh, the Moon government has shown its willingness to join an expanded uh, G7 that is not explicitly anti-China. But what happens if uh, we have a D10 that without being explicitly anti-China has the D there, the democracy? Uh, what happens if the Biden administration says, well, we're going to launch a Quad Plus? It might not be explicitly anti-China, but then you look at the members, it could be Vietnam, uh, it could be New Zealand, uh, it could be Indonesia, uh, along with Korea. So, so implicitly, the anti-China element uh, uh, would be there. So, so what happens if, if the Biden administration takes this transactional approach and says, we will support inter-Korean engagement, but in return, we want you to join these uh, new coalitions that are being created as we speak. Uh, a third point for discussion, uh, which uh, I, I think uh, in Europe, we think more about this in the context of, 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 of Iran and, and GCPOA. Uh, so I think it would be interesting to see in the context of the, of the Korean Peninsula, uh, how can South Korea, not only the Moon government, but South Korea in general ensure that any US engagement process with North Korea is sustainable, that it doesn't disappear when we have a new uh, US president. We have seen this in, in, in the past, so obviously between the Clinton and the Bush administrations, there was a complete uh, change in, 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 in policy. So what would happen if we have a Biden administration engages with North Korea? We see this engagement process uh, going well, um, and we see uh, inter-Korean relations improving. Uh, North Korea, if not 
denuclearizing, but at least taking steps towards an arms control uh, process uh, with, with, with the US. But then comes another administration that has a different view uh, about relations with North Korea. So in, in Europe, I think uh, there is a pride on the fact that GCPOA essentially survived the, the four years of the Trump administration because European power said, you know what, we're going to, um, we're going to continue to support this agreement, to, to maintain it in life support, so to speak, until we have a new US administration that is willing to resume dialogue with, uh, with, with Iran. And, and you saw Germany, France, the UK, and the European Union really um, providing the political and, and to an extent economic support for this deal to, to survive. And, and it has worked out, worked out after four years we see the potential resumption of the GCPOA. So, so how can the Moon uh, government, South Korea at large, ensure that the engagement with North Korea is, is, actually, uh, is actually sustainable? Uh, and I think this touches on a, a broader uh, point, uh, which is how do you make sure that within uh, South Korea, there is an agreement in terms of approach towards North Korea? Um, so obviously we had before the Moon administration, we had a couple of uh, conservative administrations that had a different approach towards North Korea, that thought that North Korea uh, had to uh, deserve, so to speak, uh, any economic support and engagement coming from South Korea and from the international uh, community. Uh, so, so it's a different approach from the current administration. So there is no consensus really across uh, administrations in, in, in South Korea uh, either, it seems, even though all of them say, well, engagement is part of the process towards North Korea. Some of them clearly prioritize pressure over North Korea and things that North Korea should be doing more uh, before there is uh, proper engagement uh, between the two, between the two uh, uh, Koreas. And in the last uh, couple of minutes uh, that I have, uh, uh, I want to because I actually read the, the, the three papers, so, so I recommend more for the, for, for the panel uh, as a whole, not only for, for Professor Kim's paper. Uh, the panel is on the Biden administration's Korea strategy and Korea-US uh, relations. And we heard from Professor uh, Isley and, and, and Sakata, uh, the, the strategy towards the alliance and then uh, trilateral cooperation. So, so, so what prospects do you think there is for resumption of not necessarily trilateralism, but at the very least, um, good uh, coordination between the US and South Korea, between the US, Japan, and South Korea on foreign policy matters, not necessarily only on, 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 on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, and I say this because if you compare with Europe, yes, we, we, we like the approach of the Biden administration taking towards alliances. But there is all this talk about the strategic autonomy, meaning that Europe needs to have a more independent foreign policy because a Trump might be elected in four years' time, for all we know. Right? There could be a new Trump in four years' time, eight years' time, who doesn't trust allies. So there is all this talk, yeah, it's good to have Biden in power now, but we cannot discount uh, this, this fact, right? So, so, so how do you think this could happen in a Northeast Asian context considering the same, right, that, that we could have a new Trump and, and again, we would have a, 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 an approach towards alliances that is very different from the one Biden is going to take. Uh, and, and, and one last point, uh, to, to what extent do you think uh, it is uh, uh, possible to have a process that also uh, engages China? Because China is not going to disappear, geography matters. Uh, this was mentioned by Professor Kim in his, in his uh, uh, presentation. Uh, and, and if you look at the European context, it's the same when we approach the Middle East, when we approach Russia. It's all very good to say that we want to contain Russia. It's all very good to say, you know, that let's not focus so much on the Middle East, but these are the border regions of the, of the European Union, right, of Europe. So we have to address these issues. So, so, so what about a Korean Peninsula Northeast Asian context where China is going to be there? How do you address uh, potential, the, the need actually to, to engage China uh, at some level? So I, I will leave it there and I look forward to the further discussion. Okay. Excellent. Thank you so much uh, for very comprehensive also uh, discussion and uh, interesting question as well. So I think uh, it's time for all those uh, presenters. Uh, 
to answer, to respond to those, those great uh, comments and uh, questions. So again, in the order of uh, first presentation, uh, the honor, first honor goes to Professor Easley. Thank you, Professor Shin. Uh, thank you so much for all the discussions, uh, insights. I think that uh, Dr. Kim Jina and I agree on most points, but I wouldn't overemphasize the continuity in U.S. Uh, North Korea policy. Certainly, the pendulum of U.S. policy swings less from administration to administration than, say, between conservative and progressive administrations in South Korea. Uh, but I don't think that uh, the U.S. policy is as consistent as, say, China's policy on North Korea or maybe even uh, Japan's. And, and the reasons are important. While um, the United States may maintain its strategic interests and goals, particularly vis-a-vis uh, -vis North Korea's denuclearization, I think the uh, priority and the methodology and also the interaction can be very different. So uh, across the administration. So first on the issue of priority, Trump prioritized a leader-to-leader -leader big deal. And the approach to the leader summits and deal making appeared to be a bit more made for TV than made for detailed diplomatic documents, uh, I'm, I'm sorry to say. Whereas Biden's methodology will be much more um, working level uh, talks and I think the priority will be different because the priority will be more on alliances and policy specifics, uh, right? So you have a different priority and a different uh, methodology for pursuing it. And then I think the interaction may be different. You know, North Korea is probably gonna play Biden different than they tried to play Trump. They tried to play Trump as, as okay, let's, let's go to the top, let's try to, to make a, a big deal at the, the leader level and, and get the United States to agree to suspend large-scale exercises, get the United States to try to agree to suspending uh, or even revoking a bunch of sanctions for very little uh, denuclearization progress on North Korea's part because the North Koreans appeared to believe that Trump needed uh, a big deal made for TV for his own domestic reasons and I think the North Koreans miscalculated uh, in dealing with Trump. They're going to calculate differently uh, with Biden. So the calculation that North Koreans may take toward Biden may be, okay, this guy's not gonna have a, a summit with us in a Southeast Asian capital anytime soon. So why don't we engage perhaps in the working level talks, agree to a interim or not even half, but a maybe one third kind of deal and then do what North Korea so often has done in the past, which is cheat on the agreement, right? When it gets to the verification or implementation phase, uh, North Korea goes another way after pocketing as many uh, uh, benefits as it can. So that may be, um, we may see actually a return to the past in terms of the way North Korea treats a U.S. administration. And I think those differences are uh, important, despite all the things that uh, uh, Dr. Kim Jina said that I agree with. Now, real quickly, uh, in regards to some, some other questions, uh, I think that there's a number of things that could happen to elicit North Korea's provocation. And obviously, North Korean provocations have a large range, and we've uh, addressed that a little bit here. Uh, I think on the lower end, they could just conduct some shorter range missile tests, which are the sort of things that Trump ignored because he said that wasn't our gentleman's agreement. Our gentleman's agreement was the long range stuff. So I'm just gonna ignore that and say, Kim and I have a great relationship, we're gonna do great things. Can Biden really ignore that when those short range missile tests are such a threat to South Korea, uh, even if the Moon administration may have incentive to not make it a big deal, Japan may, make it a big deal. And if, if Biden's on an alliance's first policy, and if Biden is into actually implementing UN Security Council resolutions in a multilateral framework, those, those short range violations of ballistic uh, missile uh, testing ban is, uh, is not so easy to ignore. So we may see North Korea make a provocation anywhere across a provocation uh, ladder that uh, the U.S. will have to respond to, and it may do that for different reasons, not just, as uh, Gina suggested, 
um, you know, she said that North Korea is not going to provoke because of a, a command post exercise. The United States and South Korea obviously need to do more than just command post exercises. And this next one in March may be largely on computer, but the US and uh, South Korean ally needs to return to the field. If the US and the ROC aren't doing field exercises, they're not maintaining deterrence, they're not maintaining interoperability, they're not maintaining the alliance, and they're not maintaining deterrence uh, against North Korea. And we're, they're certainly not certifying OPCON uh, transfer progress. So I think that those field exercises are coming, and I think the North Koreans may very well use it as an excuse. Uh, the North Koreans may also use an ex as an excuse uh, sanctions enforcement. I think that the, um, the Biden administration in its policy review is not only thinking about humanitarian engagement and of course very close coordination with South Korea, they're also thinking about ways of, of strengthening the sanctions regime. And uh, North Korea may not like that very much and may respond in a, in a rather ballistic uh, fashion. And then a, a final point uh, about North Korea is that you know, they may test because they say it's a domestic political anniversary. I mean, they've got plenty of reasons to test. But fundamentally, the reason why they test is to advance their military capabilities. So they're going to test in order to advance their military capabilities eventually. And I think the only thing that's going to change that current dynamic is, one, if the coordination with China is much more increased, so North Korea feels that its China card is at risk, and two, if a lot more information is getting into North Korea, ideally through inter-Korean dialogue, communication, and exchanges, that then holds the Kim regime accountable to a higher standard of performance than what it is engaged in uh, right now. And, and so um, I think that there is a window for engagement and dialogue and progress with North Korea, but it's a very narrow one and a very delicate task uh, to try to navigate through it. And allow me to just quickly uh, direct a couple questions to my fellow speakers because I thought their presentations were so interesting and the discussants didn't ask them what I wanted them to ask. Uh, I, I wish that someone would have asked Professor Sakata, you know, if, if President Moon offers an olive branch to Japan on his March 1st speech, what can Japan do to show goodwill in return? Because right now, Japan's position seems to be, if you don't go back to 1965 and you don't bring your domestic court rulings in line with your previous international commitments, then we don't want to deal. Uh, and, and I think we need probably some interim goodwill uh, before that. And, uh, and to, to Professor uh, Mike, this is a very good IHWA uh, representation on this panel, by the way. <laughs> to, to my colleague, uh, Professor Kim, uh, you know, I, I think that you ended uh, your speech uh, with a bomb, and you just put it in the middle of the room, and nobody has, uh, you know, diffused it yet. And that was, you said that it's time to start thinking about the post-moon era. What does South Korea need to do to do that? I think what you mean is that South Korea needs to build a domestic consensus for its foreign policy, and I'd love to hear your thoughts about how to do that. Thank you very much. Indeed, uh, Professor Isley, I mean, not only answering all those tough questions, but you raised the very question I really wanted to also ask. <laughs> so I think you are, you are really doing a great job, not only as a, a presenter, but also almost like uh, you, are, you are doing a kind of vice chairmanship of this uh, seminar, which I really appreciate. Thank you so much. Uh, I think the challenge goes to <laughs> Professor Sakada. You, you got all those tough questions, but please, uh, your response. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Professor Lee, uh, for your comments on my paper and, um, and also from um, uh, Ramon and uh, Leaf on, the, on your comments as well. Um, I'll just be, I'll try to be very brief <laughs> while I address all those questions. But for number one uh, from Professor Lee, um, on Korea-Japan relations, uh, how, to, how to go forward. Uh, and you mentioned the, the, the two-track approach and going back to the two-track approach. And, and so regarding this, you know, on the surface, um, as policy experts on the surface, it, they should be delinked, you know, um, history and other issues should be separate and um, managed. But I think the problem is, 
you, you need progress in, in both sides. You need progress in the history issue to actually go ahead with other, um, other areas. Um, and also, you know, uh, pol politically speaking, the politicians do link it. Uh, they need something on the history issue to move on with the other uh, e economic issues. Um, we did, uh, we were successful in, in separating, uh, insulating the GSAMIA and the def defense issues, but still, as you said, history and economies, unfortunately, um, still linked. Um, so Korea, uh, you know, what the politicians would want is that Korea needs to make space, you know, to give more assurance at, um, uh, that the 1965, you know, normalization agreement is intact, that it'll be respected, uh, and, 20, and the and the ROK government has said it it would, and it is, and it would, and um, and also on the 2015 Comfort Women Agreement, and that should that was, you know, Biden was part of that as well, <laughs> so that be respected. That the messaging is very important, um, and Japan. On the other hand, needs to make space uh, for the ROK government on, for example, on good gestures on export control and all these other issues so that the Korean um, side can move better. Um, and um, uh, what Leaf said about the, uh, if there's an olive branch on March 1st, um, it's uh, right now, um, this, the Suga government is very, 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 busy domestically and for many reasons. And also the Tokyo Olympics, uh, whether to hold that, and we had the whole debacle about some changing the, uh, the, uh, the chairman and all that. So we're really, the Japan will be really focused on whether we can hold the Tokyo Olympics or not. And, but um, that put, put that, putting that aside, you know, G, G7 summits or G, G10s or, um, all those multilateral forums would be a place to start. And, you know, we could have um, uh, Korea and Japan, Suga-san and President Moon can have summits and, and you know, uh, have good photo ops and so forth to make the situation, the atmosphere better. So um, we do need uh, more clarity that um, Korea places importance on Japan and Japan vice versa. And if there's a good message, then um, I think use like summit level, um, sorry, uh, su summit conferences, multilaterals, and and slowly um, bring in the dialogue process. But but once again, at the same time, there are senior working level talks in going on and on about um, uh, bilateral issues as well as North Korea issues. So um, that's that's my. Um, uh, ambiguous um, answer to your question. Uh, number two on, on global economy uh, and um, uh, Indo-Pacific Indo uh, that Professor, Professor Lee mentioned. Um, I think if, if, J if Korea gives us, gives us not Japan, but to the United States and the world, more, more strategic clarity on the commitment to the Indo-Pacific, which is it, which it is doing um, slowly, but if there is more strategic clarity, um, then it would make uh, make um, Korea Japan strategic cooperation easier. Um, and um, so, and there are many versions of um, Indo Pacific, um, as uh, Professor Lee mentioned. And Japan's FOIP, a free and open Indo Pacific, has been softened. It's not containment. Um, it's about competition and cooperation. And um, and there's also the ASEAN version of um, FOIP and, and the Germany version of FOIP. <laughs> so I think South Korea can um, build its own um, Indo-Pacific version. You know, you can use free and open, secure and prosperous, whatever you want. But you know, um, you, I think that um, if South Korea comes out with a little bit more strategic clarity on the commitment to the uh, Indo-Pacific um, concept, um, it would make things easier to cooperate. And um, and uh, let's see, on, on um, uh, yes, and on trilateral security cooperation, um, as Professor Lee mentioned, uh, let's see, on North Korea, um, yes, there's, the, there's only the trilateral version that US, ROK, and, um, and uh, Japan needs to work out. But actually, um, Japan is also a center um, at Yokosuka for um, 
implementing the UN's Security um, uh, Council resolutions on North Korea sanctions, in which European countries do help out. So you have to look at the trilateral cooperation plus, really, on the North Korea issue. And um, I hope the South Korea can uh, uh, join and commit a little more on that. Um, but beyond the trilateral, uh, beyond North Korea, you know, it, yes, as you say, not, everything does not have to be trilateral. It could be trilaterals within multilaterals and um, connecting with Australia and, um, and uh, you know, Germany's coming in, uh, France is already there in the uh, South China Sea. <laughs> and, um, I, I won't say, I won't ask that South Korea become, be in the South China Sea, but the point is, you know, you don't have to say China, you don't have to say South China Sea, but, you know, maritime security um, is important. Um, and South Korea, I think it's in South Korea's interest to be, uh, to be um, how to say, uh, perceived also as a maritime player. And lastly, I'll be short on uh, questions from Ramon on what can, what kind of um, um, coordination can be done uh, beyond North Korea. Um, uh, as you, the same old answers, um, digital trade and rules, <laughs> climate change. Uh, it could be in the Northeast Asia context, um, and it could be a Japan, EU, Korea. Um, you know, there's many ways to approach this and. Um, as far as strategic autonomy is concerned, you know, Japan is um, um, placing a lot of eggs into the U.S. Uh, basket, but at the same time, uh, we hedge and um, and but at, at, and also, but at the same time, um, we hope that the U.S. comes back. So that's why we kept uh, maintained the TPP, um, even if the United States is not there. Um, and on engaging China, I mean, the thorny issue is Senkaku or the Ayutai, as the Chinese say, uh, and the new maritime coast guard law is really tricky. <laughs> and, um, so that's like the biggest concern right now. Um, but so we deter and defend against that situation, but also we need to have dialogue. And one, um, thing that we do is we're trying to make the Ch Japan, China maritime, you know, prevention of incidents, talks and so forth. So these are things that um, we're doing. Japan is actually being very careful about um, China, you know, uh, competing and balancing and countering where, where, where necessary, but we're also cooperating. Um, but it will be more limited, I think, um, in terms of economic security and territorial security. Thank you. Sorry. No, thank you so much for your very uh, excellent uh, comment and, again, uh, lots of interesting point, uh, Professor Sakata. Uh, next, uh, Professor uh, Kim, uh, please, your right, Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Pacheco Pardo, uh, for your excellent questions. And uh, let me start from your first question, uh, whether North Korea will make a uh, military provocation sooner or later, and what, type, what kind of type, I mean, what type of the uh, provocations, and whether, uh, what will be the impact of the chance of engagement if, the, um, it's gonna, if they um, do. Uh, first of all, uh, let me be honest, I'm terrible at making predictions. So for your question regarding whether North Korea will uh, make um, military provocation or not, uh, please don't buy my words. Uh, but uh, what I would like to say, uh, from the um, history, uh, when we look back the, um, the era of Obama administration and Trump administration, what we saw is shortly after the inaugura inauguration of both administrations, Pyongyang launched a missile test uh, in less than two months. Um, so, so that's why people say that you know, Pyongyang may like to test uh, Biden's resolve and his gut. Um, but uh, whether it will be a missile test or a nuclear test or any provocation in smaller scale, then my prediction is uh, it will be a missile test or a smaller scale. Um, nuclear experiments, North Korea made came too far. I mean, they have completed their, the, um, they show their power and their capabilities. So their, their nuclear experiment were almost completed. But there are a few steps to go for missile test. 
and he also may like to show off the diversified uh, weapon system he has developed for the past few years behind the scene. So the end of my prediction will be if North Korea choose going the, um, provo with provocations, it will be more like missile test or other provocations in smaller size. Um, either nuclear weapon you know, test or missile test uh, will narrow down Biden's choice in dealing with um, North Korea. So in domestic politics, audiences like, like Republicans and some supporters of Trump, they will argue that, hey, Biden, you screw up all the relations with North, and then you should, they will demand something. And P Biden uh, will have to show he is a strong leader uh, fighting against um, rising threat. Uh, against the United States. If, and if uh, the uh, North Korea really wages a nuclear or missile test, it will be a nightmare uh, for Mr. Uh, Moon's um, dream of creating a uh, peace process on the Korean Peninsula. All the engagement, the momentum will be lost domestically. At the same time, he will lose um, international support. And what we expect will be um, in response to the North Korean nuclear or missile provocations, the United Nations will um, add up another sanctions on North Korea. So the, uh, that being said, the engagement uh, time will be just thrown out a window. That's uh, what I uh, kind of what I see. Um, for the second question, uh, how would the Moon government react with a transactional offer from uh, the Biden administration? Let's say uh, Biden administration saying, uh, so you can go with engagement with the Pyongyang, but in return, you should join anti-Chinese coalitions in um, D10 or uh, Quad. It poses a big, huge dilemma uh, to Seoul, but Given the fact that Moon's, uh, Moon Jae-in's priority has been uh, restoring or improving inner Korean relations, it may satisfy uh, Moon's uh, short-term goal. And joining, promising to join Quad or the uh, D10, it may make China unhappy. It will make unhappy uh, China, definitely. But, uh, I think Seoul will try to make excuse to Beijing, saying that Quad and D10, they are at infant stage of development at this moment. And Quad, let's be honest, Quad is not like NATO type alliance. It's a security dialogue, way looser form of security cooperation. And what about D10? Even though Seoul joins D10 as a proud member of the uh, democracy, established democracy in Asia, well, China will be able to see some weak links in D10, including G7 countries in, on the European con continent. For example, Italy or um, Germany. They are kind of they are skeptical and ambivalent about the idea of strengthening solidarity between or across democracies. So, um, Seoul may have a chance to push it or you know, keep the concerns of Beijing down. Just I'm kind of forced to be a member of the D10, um, but no worry, D10 is kind of just uh, a forum of leaders of democratic countries, not a serious kind of meeting against um, Beijing to counter your, your the, uh, rise. And the third, the third question, uh, which is uh, how can South Korea ensure that the other US, any US engagement process with North Korea is sustainable or durable or trustworthy? Um, when we look back the, um, the Trump era, so the, in the first few months in the office, Trump ripped off the documents for TPP and he, um, said goodbye to the, the Paris Agreement, I mean, climate change agreement. And third, he left. I mean, the United States left from the Iranian deal, um, which was co-sponsored by the um, major powers in uh, December 2015. So people will say that they are all the evidence of the, um, the United States or other democracies showing what we call inconsistency or unpredictability caused by transfer of power across political parties. True. So 
convincing North Korea, trust me, this time the U.S. commitment to engagement, it will be sincere, um, genuine, and my commitment to you, serious, no worry about it. It's a difficult, it's, it's a very challenging task for Seoul. It is difficult to exercise influence on domestic politics in foreign countries. For Seoul, it is difficult to appreciate Washington to keep your tone down and to appreciate the, um, Pyongyang not to do anything stupid. Okay. Well, and it's kind of funny. North Korea has been very hard, hysterical toward hostile rhetoric coming out from Washington. In the United States, the problem is, let's say that everything went well, so the, the Washington staying with the uh, supporting US, the South Korea's engagement with the uh, North Korea, and then, um, well, they made some kind of progress in mending relations between DPRK and the, the Washington, but United States is democracy, and there are many different voices coming out from the country. In the United States, there are North Korea sympathizers, and there are North Korea haters, and especially the latter. Uh, the latter always have strong voice, and the voice may grow up uh, in the chamber of the Congress or on newspaper and in the meeting room somewhere in Foggy Bottom or Pentagon or even the White House. The usual response from North Korea was simply not liking it. And it's, uh, the user's response was North Korea dealing with critics, uh, both big and small, and uh, shutting down diplomatic channel and raising its voices with harsher rhetoric, stronger rhetoric against the target. So, well, convincing North Korea that Washington and Seoul this time will be genuine, serious, it's a very difficult task. Um, and another question just I would like to raise is, Moon, has, Moon will be over the future government, will have a challenge to convince Pyongyang that this time Washington over the, you know, we are serious about engagement with you, but it will be more difficult for Seoul to convince Washington that Pyongyang is serious about engagement. Uh, Leif always mentioned that, and the other the, the colleagues here already mentioned that you know, th throughout the history of U.S. and North Korea relations, we have seen a lot of voluntary defection or involuntary defections for the past three decades. The level of trust between the two very low, and how to make it up, go it up, uh, it will be a very difficult challenge uh, for the under uh, Seoul. And the last question the under Leif raised, um, well, how to form the domestic consensus um, for post-moon era? Well, I have no answer about this. This is what we have to do about uh, how to deal with North Korea and which administration um, achieved what. That question has been the most politically divisive issue in Korean politics. Well, politicians have to find their answers, and scholars, we have to do our job. And media, they have to the, the create a forum for constructive uh, discussion, debate, for what has, what's wrong with the, the previous administrations and what's the, the positive things we can learn from there, and what was the, the uh, positive things and negative things from the, um, from the current administration. We need a very objective, and we need a constructive debate, not uh, just critical voices uh, based on the um, political ideology. But that's what we have to do, and one thing I'm the, um, waiting for is we have election next year. Definitely how to deal with North Korea will be rising as an uh, unimportant topic in the election, and hopefully we can form a consensus across political parties. Uh, that this is what we can give to North Korea, but for that, we have to do, we have to get something. I hope we can make some consensus on that. Okay, thank you. Excellent. Uh, we have uh, just uh, two minutes left uh, before 5.30. Uh, that is supposed to be the end of our seminar. Oh, now we have only one minute left. So uh, unless uh, the, all the other uh, panelists have a very, very urgent last minute uh, point to make, I'd like to conclude this session with my great appreciation of all those uh, panelists, including presenters, and also excellent uh, discussant. 
for your great comment. I'm sure uh, we will have many more uh, days and times, occasion to discuss all those issues that has been raised today. Uh, and uh, I'm very looking forward to the, our future uh, uh, discussion uh, among this uh, wonderful uh, panel and great expert. So before we go, uh, I'd like to invite the president of uh, KAIS, uh, uh, Professor Chun Jae Sung from Seoul National uh, University for his uh, final remarks. Please, President. 네, 감사합니다. 어, 한국말로 저 폐회사 말씀을 드리도록 하겠습니다. 어, 사실 지금 계속 코로나 어, 국면이어서요. 국내 우리 회원님들 모셔서 이렇게 회의하기가 부담스럽고 또 죄송스러운 것도 사실입니다. 어, 그럼에도 불구하고 이렇게 다 모여서 하루 종일 회의를 해 주셔서 진심으로 감사드리고요. 또 해외에서도 시차가 있어서 많이 어려우신데 에, 참여를 해 주셔서 하루 행사를 잘 마칠 수 있었습니다. 에, 오늘 회의를 보면서 두 가지 정도 강조를 드리고 싶은 것은 첫 번째는 어, 학술 회의이지만 정책 관련 이슈를 다루는 다른 회의들도 굉장히 사실 많이 있습니다. 그럼에도 불구하고 어, 우리 국제 정치학회 많이 할수 있는 그 현안과 어, 정책 이슈이지만 그것에 학문적이면서도 이론적인 배경을 가지고 어, 한국 사회의 목소리를 낼수 있는 곳은 우리 국제정치학회 뿐이기 때문에 어, 그런 면에서 굉장히 의미 있는 회의였었다고 생각이 되고요. 또 하나의 주안점은 우리 소장학자 회원님들의 목소리를 더 들으려고 하고 있습니다. 그래서 오늘도 뭐 하루 종일 지켜봐 주신 어, 시청해 주신 여러 분들께서 느끼셨겠지만 굉장히 새롭고 참신한 아이디어 또 분석들이 많이 있었습니다. 그런 면에서 또 다른 의미가 있었던 회의라고 생각이 됩니다. 오늘 주제였었던 이제 미국의 외교 정책은 앞으로도 계속 우리가 다루어야 될 그런 주제인 것 같습니다. 또 관련된 한반도 이슈나 아까 우리 신성호 교수께서도 말씀하셨듯이 계속 이야기를 해야 되는 주제이기 때문에 우리 학회에서도 여건이 되는 대로 어, 올해 또 다루어 보도록 하겠습니다. 어, 3월이 이제 시작되면서 또 다른 학술 행사들을 기획하고 있습니다. 우리 회원께서 많이 관심 가지고 어, 참여해 주시면 감사하겠습니다. 마지막으로 우리 오늘 회의 준비해 주신 우리 사무국 또 상임 이사분들 특히 황재환 총무 이사께서 많이 고생을 하셔서 어, 감사 말씀드립니다. 네, 여러분 다 건강하시고 오늘 회의까지 같이 해주셔서 감사드립니다. 이상으로 마치겠습니다.